Okay, so uh, just before we started recording, we were actually talking about uh, your day job and it's something that I know you're very proud about and it's something that I've always kind of wanted to talk to you more about. So let's just kick off by by doing that and, and talking about that uh, now that we've actually got the episode the episode rolling. And uh, as always, I'm sure I'll jump about from subject to subject. And I'll come back and give you a wee introduction. This is actually your second time on the podcast, and I want to talk a wee bit about that as well. But uh, yeah, so welcome, first of all, and let's pick up where we were a wee second ago then with regards to what you do during the day. Uh, well, my day job's functional behaviour analysis. So I work predominantly with um, autistic adults. Okay. In the room, and they have some some of the people that we support will have behaviours that challenge. There's people go, oh, they're not really, you know, this term challenging behaviour is quite outdated in terms of the way that the thinking is behind it. You know, yeah. it's all just expressive communication difficult. That's all it is. You yeah. know, um, but it gives you a fascinating insight into the way. The, the human brain actually operates and how somebody can, you know, reach that crisis point uh -huh. where they fight or flight. Um, well, there's, it's actually fight, flight, freeze or flop. Okay. Flop and drop, sorry, there's five of them. Right, yeah, yeah. And that's kind of the, and that's the very same three your brain. That's the bit when you hit a certain anxiety level and the front of your brain switches off. And the front of your brain is the part that deals with reason and logic and thinking yeah. and processing and all of that. That all switches off and you go to the very centre and that's when you have your sort of fight and flight reflex, as they call it. I know of just... Okay, uh, let's take a wee step back then because... So, you were back on episode nine, believe it or not, of the podcast... And we're now on 48, I believe you're going to be again. Mm -hmm. And we were talking maybe three or four weeks ago and had one of our usual big discussions. And I was thinking, I wish I said this to you, actually. I wish I had recorded this for a podcast. And I know we were talking about, you've, you've got to have a, a time where you can sort of have a personal private discussion with friends as well. But uh, anytime we talk, I'm thinking... Oh, I wish, I wish I, sh I should have recorded this. So that's why we got to hear for everybody that's listening and now watching, because you were on, as I say, episode nine, and at that stage the podcast was just audio. So we're now yeah. audio and YouTube, which is a, which been a really big sort of positive step forward. Uh, so that's just setting the setting us up for what we're going to move forward and do it now. If anybody wants to go back, as I say, it is episode nine. And when you first were on the podcast, we talked about your, obviously, more of your martial arts journey, your uh, competition career, and kind of laid down the foundations. But you're one of the people who, who I know has so much more to bring to the podcast other than just going through a sort of chronological stage of your, your life and your, and your, your career. Uh, and you've kicked that off straight away by talking about what you're talking about with your, your sort of, your, your job. See the thing about your, the front of your brain being the logical part. I found out very recently that as those sort of fight and flight and panic and anxiety sort of chemicals start flowing into your brain, that that front part, that uh, prefrontal cortex, can close down between, I believe it's 60 and 80%. So if you're in a logical state of mind and then something happens, and in many cases for people that could be like a panic attack, for example, this part where you can take a step back and say, I'm not having a heart attack, I'm not going to die, I'm not whatever, it actually shuts down between 60 and 80%. Is, is that about right? 
Uh, it's actually, uh, it's, it's kind of varies um, okay. for, for, for some people who are sort of more logical thinkers and stuff like that, who kind of live in this front part of their brain. You're looking at around about 60% that will shut down. For right. However, if you have any kind of what's called a working memory deficit, okay. that shutdown is actually close up to 100%. And that's the thing. Now, working memory is basically if I gave you 15 bits of information just now, yep. you could recite back to me maybe about seven or eight of those. Okay. You you would never get all 15. It's impossible. Right. Your brain just doesn't retain it. Okay. It won't process it. So if I gave you 15 bits of information, you'd recite about seven back. But if you've got working memory deficit, you're probably looking at maybe three or four parts right, of okay. that that you could actually give me yep. now the difficulty with that is is that's your the way your brain processes is it gets all this information and it goes into something called vector space now your vector space is where your brain chops it the bits that it doesn't want okay or does it mean then leaves it away and chucks it away or, you right. know puts it to another bit of your brain um now what happens is you can get this like sort of car jam going on where you get this backup of information that you're needing to process. Yep. If you've got a working memory deficit, this just keeps backing up and backing up and backing up until such point it just all floods in at one go. Wow. This okay. is people tend to call overload if they feel overwhelmed or overloaded with information or um, they, they just feel it's too much, it's too much information I can't handle it. That's anxiety getting driven up with the fact that they can't process Okay. Fasting. And that, that's just basic working memory of your neurotypical person. If you have a neuro, if you have a neurodiversity or you're neurodivergent or there's a, a working memory deficit of any sort, that backup's going to be longer, but the onrush is even bigger. You know? Okay, of course, yeah. The, the bigger the dam, the more water comes out when that floods, you know, and that's what can create anxiety and panic and this is why if you have any kind of neurodivergence that is more of a shutdown of your frontal cortex right. than would normally happen yeah and um, that, that's really really important and not just in my role of, of trying to understand what a, a, a behavior is trying to tell us mm -hmm. but also in terms of a self-defense or martial arts perspective yeah because you have to train to be able to keep reason. You know, you can train it so that you hit that 60%. If you if you lose 60% of your function, you're, do, you're doing not too bad, actually. You know, yeah. that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. You know, in the middle of a fight, to be able to think at 40% normal capacity yeah. is, is pretty good going. But if that totally shuts down, but you need to train it. Yeah, you have you have to train that part of your brain to kind of stay alive and stay active and stay dominant. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, if you don't do that, it doesn't. If you're not able to do that, it doesn't matter how much you know. You're never going to be able to use it, yeah. you know. And and that's the thing. This is why there's this, it's it's quite difficult with this. You know, when we start going down this road because we start getting into things like our application of technique and yep. all of this kind of thing and the problem I have with that and that is because of this just the basic psychology and the basic um, neurology of the brain is that if you do let's take dosan for example yeah okay um, and you have nine or ten different functions within that different applications, different things that these things are for. Yep. How many of those do you think you're going to remember? So just uh, just before we, 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 we talk about this and to give myself a wee bit of a chance to think about that, <laughs> hint, hint, <laughs> Green doesn't know, uh, we're talking about one of the Taekwondo patterns or one of the Taekwondo forums. That's one of the things that I've learned as I've done more of the podcasts. You start talking to people about stuff and people who don't do Taekwondo are already thinking, what the hell are these guys talking about? So what we're talking about now is one of the Taekwondo patterns. And what, what's your question? How much of that do you think you would be able 
You would remember? Yeah. Or, yeah, if there's nine or ten different applications in one pattern, in the middle of a fight, how many of those applications are you actually going to be able to remember? I think very, very few, if any. I, That's yeah, my I think, personal thought. Yeah, I think if you remember one, you're doing very, very well. Yeah. Uh, I've, I, I mean, for those who don't know, Dosan is a, a low-grade pattern, so you probably do that uh, green stripe yep. for, for the, the Chang Hong um, followers. I know that other um, styles will have different uh, grades that they do that at. Yep. But, so, so it's a low-level pattern. It's a low-grade pattern. It's, a, it's very much a beginner's pattern. But also I've been doing that 34 years now, roughly. Yep that one pattern and I would not be confident to be able to use any of that pattern within a street fight and that kind of says you know for something to be a learned reflex you have to do it around about 4,000 times okay you know this magic number at 10,000 you know yeah it comes from the Bruce Lee quote the 10,000 kicks yeah it's not it's not quite accurate Natural studies show that on average it's about 4,000 times okay. for something to be a learned reflex. Now, that would mean that you would have to apply that technique in a situation 4,000 times for it to become a learned reflex and then keep topping it up and keep yeah. doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it. Now, the, in GTF Taekwondo, and with this dirty patterns, this dirty forms, some of them are 117 moves long. <laughs> At what stage am I going to be able to do each one of those applications 4,000 times and continuously do them yep. to maintain that level of learned reflex? And then the learned reflex is only for specific circumstances, very specific circumstances, because you can't generalize them. Yeah, you know, so certainly in the application of technique that you get from the Encyclopedia of Taekwondo or from, from other sources, yeah, they're very, very specific to very set circumstances. And I'm not being funny, but I've never seen a, a fight to go to a certain set of circumstances. It's yeah. always been very fluid, you know. Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Yeah, and it's different in sparring because sparring is within a rigid framework. You know, yeah. so you've got very specific techniques that you use religiously. And a anybody that's done any kind of level of, of, of sparring knows that they have a set go to of techniques. Yep. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you, look at the, you look at the best ones like Pierre Gwenny or Bill Superfoot Wallace, even, you know, he had three kicks. Pierre yeah. Gwenny did basically a side kick and an axe kick, <laughs> albeit they were Aye. damn good. <laughs> You know, uh, oh, and his front hand slip of the jab. You know that that was that was a joy as well. Yeah. But they were they were his go-to technique. So you trained those religiously to the point where you were able to do them without the conscious thought. So, but to do that on a scale that requires within the application of technique is impractical, and the brain cannot do that they can simply can't process that amount of information and then relay that in specific circumstances when the front part is dealing with the reason is gone yeah you know and you're purely running on instinct so now sorry go on no no carry on carry on just well, okay let, let me jump in there and just ask you a question then since since we said that so I want, I want to make sure that uh, this subject that we've stumbled on already, as you well know, uh, and again, we've spoken about this sort of off camera, is, is a passionate subject for a lot of people within martial yeah. arts. And what I'm talking about is the subject of not just how we apply our techniques, but is there different ways of applying our techniques? Is there... Uh, secret ways of applying our techniques, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So yeah. let's take. We won't even. We won't even say that it's from a pattern or a kata mm. or a form. Let's just say a middle block, right? Middle block yeah. that you can get in most martial arts. So 
you're in the, the martial arts school and you're walking up and down the floor or you're even doing partner work and you're practicing this middle block and your mind's in a very relaxed state because it's your buddy that you're training with, uh, you know everybody, you feel safe and you're drilling, drilling, drilling. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, if you were to be walking out the cinema one night and you are suddenly attacked by somebody, what are we saying that your ability for the front part, this thinking part of your brain to process that middle block is it's scientifically proven that that is vastly diminished. The, that process that your brain says, right, right, Kareem, remember you were in the school, you put your hand here, then you put your hand there, and that stops somebody from punching you. That's what we're saying, isn't it? Or is that, I'm, I'm not like to put words in your mouth, but that's what I'm hearing. That, that is effectively what I'm saying. However, what that drilling does is probably more important than the actual application, okay? Because what it does is it teaches our body a certain way of moving. It teaches our body this twist, this movement, this action, the biomechanics of it, Yeah. okay? Now, if you, for example, if you train and you train pretty, okay? Now, what I mean by that is technically accurate, nice posture, nice pose, but no real power. Yeah. Then what you're going to do is you're going to teach your body that that's how it's done. So you're never actually teaching your body the biomechanics of really smashing something, you know? Yeah. And that's what it's really about. So this drilling actually does something more important than the block does. Your reactions will guard up, they'll move, they'll put their, your hands in the way of their hand which is at the end of the day what a block is, isn't it? You know, it's yeah. getting your hand so that that doesn't smash your face in, you know? And that's what it's about. So your reactions will be there. And this is, you know, your one step and stuff like that, your three step and two step. That's all about timing and reaction, and getting your hand to a place when that threat is, oh, it's not really a threat at that point, but, yeah. you know, it's all about that timing. Now, it is difficult because... Blocks really aren't blocks in, in, in a lot of terms. You know, they're, you would net, by the time you've gone this way for a middle block, for example, the, the punch is already through you. You know, yeah. a, a punch takes what, 0 0.4 seconds to reach yep. your face. Your reaction time is 0 0.2 seconds. Get your hands up, there's another 0 0.2. So you've maybe got the chance yep. to get your hands up, but you ain't got the chance to bring the block out. Yeah. So that you know, and one of the dangers that we have in line work in particular, in patterns especially, and this goes for all martial arts. This isn't just related to Taekwondo. This is yeah. for all martial arts that we train to a rhythm. Yeah. Everything's rhythmic. Yeah. Everything's a movement. Everything's a timing. As soon as somebody moves outside of that rhythm, we struggle. Yeah, we really struggle. I mean, you you know it yourself. Who are the worst people in the world to spar? You took the words right out of my mouth. I, I talk about this often. I would, I, I nearly said I would rather spar you than a white belt, but I wouldn't. <laughs> but I take that back. I take that back because I've, I've no. So I would rather spar uh, an average black belt, no you, uh, uh, than a white belt, and it's it's to yeah. do with that rhythm and the fact that they don't have any. No, yeah. yeah. So and, there's punches and, and legs and everything flying everywhere. It's a nightmare. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it's, it's absolutely horrific. So white belts are the worst people to, to, to spar against because they don't have that rhythm. And they don't, they, they, they haven't trained into that rhythm yet. So you don't know what to expect. You don't yep. know what's coming. Then they do something really mental. Usually take your shin off you or something like that, yep. you know? Yeah. So it, it is... From that perspective, this is a, a difficulty in all martial arts because all martial arts train to that. Every single one, bar, I can't think of any that don't actually, not off the top of my head. I'm sure there are some out there, but generally not. Um, but this was something that was highlighted when I was training with Chris Cadelli for the year. Yeah. In, in the Sunday club, which was just mind-blowing experience. 
It was so incredible. I mean, honestly, the guy's on a different stratosphere. It's just unbelievable. You know, when he hits it, oh my God, you stay hit. <laughs> you absolutely stay hit. It was demonstrating um, one of the techniques and he literally tapped me in the soul. And it was no more than a tap. I couldn't stand. Yeah. You know, it was like, boom. And I was like, I'm okay, I'm okay. I tried to breathe in. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. You, you and I spoke and, about this, and he actually spoke about, I had Chris Cardelli on the podcast as well, and uh, yeah. he actually, in turn, was very complimentary yourself, which obviously I agreed with, uh, everything yeah. he was saying. But tell us a wee bit about that before we, for anybody who didn't listen to the, the first podcast that you and I done, tell us a wee bit about the Sunday Club and, and about Chris Cardelli. And, well, and the, the Sunday Club was a, a collection of a, a variety of martial artists from the UK, and we were invited. We had to apply to, to go on to it. Uh, yeah. We went down and trained on the first Sunday of every month for a year. Um, yeah. I, I missed one because of the train strike or something, but I managed to get to, to, to most of them. And yeah. It was just... It was an incredible experience. Um, there was him, uh, Master Neil, and uh, Seth, I forget his surname, that's terrible. Um, but the three of them were absolutely amazing. And what they did was we were going through the, it was basically his ABC combat system mm -hmm. that we were doing. And we were doing the first sort of element to it. Um, and what it did was it showed it showed a lot of the failings within martial arts and I mean that in a really good way Yeah, um, because it showed the lie is too strong a word but it kind of fits because it's something that we perpetuate a lot yeah. you know and that is to say that we are somehow you know this if you if you learn this this is going to protect you you're going to be able to block a kick you're going to be able to punch them you're going to, be able to block a punch somehow you'll get superhuman ninja powers from 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 doing these things and it's what it did was it showed that you know martial arts and taekwondo in particular are far more effective than we actually realize yep we just don't realize their full potential. Uh, if you take uh, the Taekwondo as an example, uh, there's only three basic technical principles in Taekwondo. Yeah. It's just three. You know, that's all there is. There's an inward movement, there's an outward movement, and there's a thrusting or a piercing movement. Yeah. That, you know, that is all there is. And it's the same for the legs as it is for the hands. And as uh, when you break it down to being that basic, you start to realise where the actual potential for Taekwondo, or martial arts in general, really lies. And it's in that biomechanic movement, mm -hmm. understanding the basic technical principles. So when it comes to it, you can hit something, and it stays hit. Yep. And you're out of danger, you know. But this is the whole premise of that whole year, and all we did was drill those three principles. Yeah. And that was that for eight hours every time. We just drilled and drilled and drilled and drilled. That's all we did. Constant drill and drill. And I remember he taught us how to move. This was in the first session. And we were going up and down this hall with the movement. And about three hours later, we're still going <laughs> up and down yeah. with that same movement. And my calves were burning. <laughs> I mean, literally they were beyond burning. In fact, I think we were just made of like molten steel. <laughs> point you know it was so much pain but it was just constant and that's what it was you know and every time we left there we had to go away and do one um element ten thousand times before we went back yeah and he knew who hadn't been doing it i bet he did right he, yeah he could tell straight away because you haven't done it no, haven't so you know? let's 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 see if you can explain that to us a wee bit uh a wee bit more so the when I, I remember coming through to the Jukam Centre, uh, which is on your hoodie, give the, the full time academy a wee shout out. And uh and it's training together and you try to explain it to me as sort of like pitching a baseball. So that would be your inward motion. And I know yeah. 
people might just be listening to this, but they can follow on. So pitching the baseball or throwing a ball, the frisbee. Yeah. So the way you would throw a, a frisbee would be the outward motion and then pushing a button would be yeah. the, the pushing, the thrusting motion. So yeah. again, we can talk about Taekwondo, but that can be, we could be talking about Kung Fu, Karate, whatever. So give us a couple of examples of those elements in, in Taekwondo. So like the the throwing of the frisbee would be like a knife throwing hand strike or a back fist. Back fist, knife hand strike, middle block, middle block, rising block. All right. of those are just variations of an outward motion. Yeah. Which I, which I, I, I gladly call throwing the frisbee. You know, the, the reason I say throwing a frisbee is because what we have to realize is that the hand is not what produces power. Yeah. You know, the hand is the frisbee. Yeah. Yeah. When you throw a frisbee, it's not the frisbee that's creating the power. And the same thing for the hand. It's not the hand that creates the power. Everything starts from downwards and upwards through, you know, it's the whole body generates the power. Yeah. So that's why I, I, I use that term to, to try and link it to that. But yeah, it's the back fist, knife hand, you know, your rising block, all of those middle block um, are just outward motions. Yeah. And they're just a variation of a theme. You know, and it's the same with inward motions. You know, your inward motions like your knife hand and bench hand and all of those. Yeah. They're exactly the same technique. All they are is a variation on a theme. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, you get very, very specific as certain things are attacked in certain areas. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where it does get slightly complicated, you know, because to get into certain areas, you have to hit. A, a very particular way yeah. and with a particular part of the body. However, if you're able to think on those lines that I can see his neck, I'm going to strike in at his neck yeah. while somebody is trying to stick a knife in you, bash on. Yeah. I don't think I would be able to think that clearly, you know. Um, but that, that you know, that's that's my take on it. But th this is what you know, when, when we were doing it, we were drilling it, we were drilling it, we were drilling it. When we got home, we were drilling some more, drilling some more. Yeah. You know, and, uh, I, I'm taking cramp on the train on the way home and stuff <laughs> like that. Both hamstrings, but I um, <laughs> try keeping quiet in the ca quiet carriage when you're hanging over the seat screaming. <laughs> it was horrendous. Probably it's, taking you know, cramp in the way down just thinking about it. What was <laughs> uh, it was... Uh, but yeah, so when you're drilling and you're drilling and you're getting to it, and you know what, for me, it was really strange because it was when I came home and I was actually walking my dog and I was throwing the stick for him. That's when it twigged. That's what, pardon the pun, but <laughs> you know, that, that's, when, that's when it clicked with me. Yeah. And I, I, I got it at that very moment when I threw the stick, I was like, oh my God, I know what it means. Mm -hmm. I know what he means, and I, re I actually really got it. And it's a very hard thing to describe, but you know, uh, everything became clear, and the reasons why we did things became clear. The reasons for patterns, the reasons for these things became very clear and very obvious almost. Yeah. Once I cut past the lie, you know, the perpetuated lie that we have in martial arts that somehow. You know that we, we do self defense. We don't really. We train in a combat system. You know that martial arts were designed for combat. Yeah. You know, um, and, and it, it's, a, it's a thing that another thing that kind of got around my mindset as well was that you know you know as martial artists we always take the sort of moral code or moralistic view yep. of what we do about fair fights and all that. Well, why are you training? You're not training to equal that person. You're training to get the better of them. You're training to make it an unfair fight. Yeah. That's the whole point. Even Miyamoto Musashi he used to jump out of bushes. Yeah. You know, you to ambush people. He was an actual douchebag, you know? Yeah. But that's it's combat. The, it's combat. combat. That's it. That yeah, it's like that's, it's, that's the difference. Yep. 
Yeah. Yeah, it's combat you're in. So when when you're when you're talking about going into self defence, it's not really self defence. You're not trying to even up the score. You're trying to be better than that person. You're trying to get over that person. You're trying to defeat that person. You're not trying to be pals with them. You know, yeah. You're not trying to be on a level foot. You're trying to be stronger or faster or more resilient than they are. So that's really what it's about, you know. Uh, and what and that's where the lie. And I, I don't like using the word lie, but it's the only word I can actually think of yeah. with it because we all perpetuate it, you know. So if, if you could put that, if you could put that lie, yeah. and I, I fully understand you're 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 being uncomfortable with that. I, I get that you it makes you uncomfortable, but just to be really super clear here, if you were to put that lie into a sentence, what is the lie? What's the lie? Just to be really obvious that X Y Z martial art does this. So what is that lie? The martial arts are self defense. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The, the, this myth that we perpetuate that somehow martial arts are about self defense. Self defense is about defending yourself. You know, what we do is so much more potent, so much more effective than just, you know, block and punch. Yeah. It's way more than that. And that's the thing. This is where, you know, it is difficult because I, I, the only word I can use is lie. You know? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, but it really stems from when they try to civilianize. We're mis-selling it. That's what we're doing. We're mis-selling the product. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We are. We are. But this is where um, things like, you know, where you see the combat sports becoming exceptionally popular. Uh, and stuff like that is because they don't miss sell the product. It is exactly what it says on the tin, <laughs> you know. Yep. Uh, and, and that's where I think with martial arts rather than the sort of combat sports side is really kind of missing out um, because we don't we don't show exactly what it is that we do. You know, we say you know you're blocking, you're blocking. You, you're, no, this isn't. You know, it's more than that. There's more to it than that. You know, when you're doing the patterns, it isn't a case that you have multiple imaginary attackers. You know, you look at the patterns. It's absurd to think that that's what you're doing. Yeah. There's no part of the pattern where you could go, yes. You know, and then, I mean, no offence to anybody that, that, that does the, the, the patterns applications. Everything has to have a purpose and so on and so forth, and I get why they do it. Um, what what I do disagree with, and I will say it now, is the people that actually change the pants to fit their application. I don't get that. Yep, I hear you. I, I, I saw one that was doing a, a pattern where it was a, a block and then a front kick and a punch, and they changed the kick. It's like, well, that, I, I, I don't get it. You know, and I couldn't understand how they could say that is the application of the pattern when you're changing the kick to fit your application. Yeah, it's nonsense. Yeah, it makes absolutely no sense because what you're telling them is that you're training them. <laughs> you know, you're, you're, you're training this way, you're doing this pattern, you're doing this form, but it's not what you think it is. This is what it is. And that kind of leads into what you were hinting earlier about that secret application thing that some people seem to think that there is, that they, yep. they, they the harbinger, harbingers of all knowledge in terms of they have this sort of secret thing. No, they don't. They're, they're trying to sell something, you know? Yep. Um, and it's not, this is where the, the application technique goes wrong, you know? Because you're not training that way. So if you're not training that way, how do you expect to overcome right back to where we started? Yep. How do you expect to overcome that memory deficit that you will experience when that adrenaline kicks in? I've said... Uh, I, being involved in that conversation very recently, one of the things where... I had to put my hand up and say I dealt with it wrong and 
was corrected by someone who I still have a lot of, a ton of respect for. And they actually taught me a lesson that day. And the lesson was, there, there's, if I'm trying to promote my thinking or my ideals, then you shouldn't go about, you, you, you do this very well. You shouldn't go about uh, criticizing others to bring your ideas to the forefront. So, yeah. so I just need to stress that that's not what this is about. I'm no. going to now talk about what you think and what I think. Mm. And that obviously contradicts what a lot of other people think, but I get that. Yeah, and the, the, the thing is with that, people are entitled to think or train in a way that they feel is, is correct. Yeah. And that's absolutely right. And if that is what they think, then that is fine. Unfortunately, the science behind it doesn't support their theory. Yeah. And this is where the difficulty for me in particular comes in because for, for me, unless something is demonstrably factual, I cannot accept it as being true. Yeah. And 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 that's where my issue comes in with it, you know. <laughs> Some people that know me will be throwing things at the screen right now because this is the guy who 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 recently fasted for 30 days because of his imag imaginary friend in the sky. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, uh, no, what we, what we have to separate belief. Anybody can believe anything that they like. That That is fine. That is absolutely fine. If somebody wants to believe in Santa Claus for all their life, you know what, let them believe in Santa Claus. It does nobody any harm. What where I find it, I take exception to it, is when somebody tries to say that it's demonstrably true. Yeah. Because they can't, and that's unfair. And it's unfair to their own faith, it's unfair to their own belief to say that it's demonstrably true. Yeah. Do, do you know what I mean? Because yeah. what it does is it, it removes the actual need for it. Do you know? But that's just where I come from. That's that's my my perspective. Is, is that when and it's the same for martial arts. You know, martial arts and religion in a lot of ways are very very similar. Yep. You know, yeah. Very very similar. Um, people have a belief within martial arts that this thing does this. Great. Show me. Show me with somebody that doesn't know what you're going to do. Yep. Show me that in a situation where you don't know it's going to happen. Show me in a fluid environment that that, with what you're doing, works. If they can't do that, then they cannot demonstrate it to be true. Yep. And that's the thing with that. And, but if they if they believe that that works and that that is what that is for, then great, that's fine. You know, um, much respect. And I like what certain people do. It's what they do is they'll show they'll say, well, look, it might be for this. Mm -hmm. This might be what that is. What do you think? Yeah. And what they do is they open up the question, and they open up the thinking. Rather than saying no, it is this. Well, could it not be this as well? Yeah, you know. Yeah. No, it can't be that. Well, who 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 says if it works, it works. It doesn't yep. matter what you say, or what I say, or what anybody else says. If it's effective in a fluid, unpredictable environment, then it works, and it's as simple as that. And that is where it becomes demonstrably true. Okay, that leads me into the next thing that I want to talk to you about. But one thing I want to add into that, and this theme will run through the full discussion, I feel, today. So you, you've you always came across to me and you've always been ahead of me in this thought process 
And that's why I, I discussed this with you because I think we're at least on the same path. But I've got much to learn for you because I, I do know that you're further along on this thought pattern, this path, that you're constantly seeking the truth of things by, and again, the last time we spoke off camera, I was telling you about how I'm taking my Taekwondo at the moment and just ripping it to pieces. Uh, and and how that's similar to my religious faith is that the more I rip it to pieces, the more wonderful I find it. Yeah. And and it's and again, this is just me speaking from a personal point of view, but the more and again, again, let me go off on another quick mini tangent. When you talk about religion and science, they don't have to be one or the other. No. But obviously you think, right, well, you can't prove that God exists or you can't prove much of what religion tells us. But the more science I read, the more, uh, I mean, I'm reading stuff by like uh, Dawkins, Sam Harris, all these atheists, and what they say is actually factually correct. They, nobody's lying there, but all the science I read makes me believe in God even more. That's just my personal view. And with my Taekwondo, the more bits that I pull apart and say, well, hold on a minute, do not try and tell me that you're going to knife hand guarding block somebody on the street. Don't tell me that. But see, when I realise that it's a lot of, it is what it is, that then leads me down another five paths to, right, so what am I actually doing here? What's my body doing? What are my arms doing? And I then get to a position where I believe in my Taekwondo even more than what I did before I ripped it to pieces. Yeah, and that is the whole point of martial arts. Now, just jumping quick back to the religion thing, it was, uh, I think it was Einstein who said, the more I understand about the universe, the more I believe in it all. You don't have to be a, you don't have to be an atheist to be a scientist, just like you don't have to be, um, you know, you don't have to follow a religion to believe in God. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a dichotomy, but, you know, the more people, the more you rip things to shreds and the more you look into it, the more you should be excited about what you find. Yeah. And that was, that was the whole point of when I started my journey down that path was I was questioning everything, you know, literally everything, every little bit of what I was doing is like, what is the point of this? And I was actually, it's funny because you know what got, got me started down that path? Top Gear. Top Gear? Top Gear, believe it or not, there was an episode of Top Gear and what it was, was there was a, a thing where they were seeing what cars were art. Right. And there was a statement within that that said art can have no function other than itself. Now, take that into context of the martial arts, what is the art? And we always say it's your patterns. Yep. Your patterns are your art. Well, if that's the case, that means they have no function. Because they can't, art can have no function other than itself. So that's where it really stemmed from. And I started thinking of probably over thought it to be honest but that's when I started thinking well what am I actually doing here what is the point in doing this random collection of silly moves and my little white jammies what does it mean what does it actually incur what, what am I doing what am I getting out of this what, what is the purpose behind doing any of this and it kind of linked into my work in the functional analysis all of those things, what is the function of this behavior? What, what am I actually getting as a result of this? You know, what am I learning? What, what does this technique do? What does that technique do? Okay, you say it does this, but then that absolutely conflicts with the, the, the evidence to suggest I'll never remember to do it. I mean, where have you seen in a fight somebody doing a W shape walk? I hear you. Yeah. I, I would be amazed. It'd be cool, but 
but and well, maybe it's not a, a but or a however. Uh, when you sat and thought about this over and over and over again, mm. let me uh, compare that to. So this enlightenment that you're looking for, this, what is the actual answer here? What's the point of this? I'll compare that to my uh, belief that there's a, a God. The more that you broke it down and said, what is the actual point of me doing this? If Why should I practice one yo pattern, this, this move and then this move and this? What, I'm never going to use that in the street. I bet you got back to a point where there's never been a time in history where there was a uh, more point to do it. You, you, and that's, do you know what I'm saying? It's like me reading all these books saying all of this science, and I agree with it all. I don't want anybody watching a wee bit of this podcast. And then I am, I am far from a science denier, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but it's the exact same as, as it's the same process as what, you've went through and what I'm going through now. Yeah. There's so much point to everything we do if you find yeah, it. It absolutely is. And that was the whole point of ripping it up. Which is when you rip it up and you cut past the the doctoring. Yeah. You know the, the indoctrination that happens in martial arts. Once you cut past that and you cut past this ridiculous notion that somehow one style or one form or one badge is more relevant than another you know once you cut through that absurdity you start to understand what it's really about and that's when it really opens up you know yeah um, and that's when you start seeing things slightly differently but you're more excited by it. i'm probably more excited by taekwondo now than I ever have been, you yeah, know, me in, in my 34 years. And it's because I'm questioning, I'm still questioning everything. I found the purpose of it and I know what it's all about and I understand that what you're doing is you're teaching your body on a constant basis, just the way that you would be. And I know in some faiths, for example, you would pray seven times a day during certain periods and things like that, you know, a certain thing. And it's not the act of praying that's important. It's what you're teaching yourself during yeah. that time. It's that self-reflection, that constant striving for better. You know, that's what's really important. The actual action isn't really important. You know, that isn't what it's about. It's, it's what comes as a result of it. And that's where I think... So many people go wrong, and you, you, you see it, you know, and you know exactly what I mean with that. Yeah, you you were one of the first people to put me on to Masashi actually years ago, years and years yeah. ago. And uh, my, my black belts will be laughing at this because they know what I'm going to say now before I even say it because I try and bring it in any, any conversation about anything. But what one might say is, is that when you know the way broadly, you see it in all things. And that is a... That is a <laughs> and it's spot that on. It is. And that, that, is the, that is the real purpose behind what you're doing. That's yeah. the real function, is getting to that place where you see it in everything. I mean, you'll know when you've been in martial arts too long, when you start turning on light switches with knife hands or, start closing fridges with hook kicks and things like that. And it's these automatic things that you do and you don't even really think about it, you know? Although I got it wrong one time. I've had a few beers and <laughs> put the light switch through the wall. Uh, you know, so I was Mr. Popular in the house that night. That I... is, you know, it is, uh, that, that's what it's really about when you see it, you know? It, and the, one of the funniest things about what I used to like to do when I was on the doors was watch people fight yep. out in the street. And you'll always notice that whenever, especially Scottish men, I don't know why, but <laughs> particular Scottish men run away from each other before they start fighting. And okay. they do it. They'll, they'll always, you watch them, they'll always take a couple of steps back 
and then they'll rush it. And watching that, and you think, what are they doing there? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. and the way they go, and all hell breaks loose, you know. Um, but it, it, it's watching that, and you start to see it, and you start to think, well, wow, I wouldn't do that. That's crazy. What, what are you doing that for, you know? And you look at things in a slightly different manner, you know, seeing things broadly, you know, know things broadly, and you'll see it. And all it's one of the, it, that is really one of the quotes for, for, for martial arts. One of the uh, one of the very selfish things that you can do when uh, you've got a podcast is you can you can start name dropping. <laughs> so major name drop coming here, but when I had Jeff Thompson on the podcast, traditional martial artist, that if you tell me somebody who's more famous for street self defence, street combat in the UK than Jeff Thompson. A way that, do you know, he, oh, be struggling. he would be struggling. And he said uh, pretty much exactly what you've said about, I actually, to be fair, didn't investigate this as much with him as what I did with you, but him realising that this block doesn't work. It's not even meant to be for that. Uh, yeah. This this bit doesn't work. And this is where I will remain passionate about this practical application thing. Going way back to, and by the way, I've still not asked you the question. I, I was going to ask you 10 minutes ago when I went off on this tangent, but it's, it's all right telling students that this block is for this and it's going to work. And you might leave your class that night thinking that you've, you've passed something on or whatever, but it's a different story when, somebody comes up and just smashes your skull in because you've got some false confidence that a Taekwondo W-shaped block's going to get you out of trouble. Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, and, and if people want to contact me and criticise this, then make make an organised line. Uh, but you're cheating students. Yeah. I don't want you I'm, to say this. I, I'm happy enough to say this. You're cheating people if you're telling them that there's a, there's a practical application to something when there isn't it, and uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, and I, I, I wholeheartedly agree that I, I, I do think that the that absence of critical thought towards what you're actually doing is probably one of the most damaging things that you can have in martial arts. Yeah, and I, I, I know grandmasters that can't critically analyze the facts. They can't critically analyze what they've been taught from, uh, say, General Choi, for example. Yep. General Choi says it, therefore it's gospel. Well, no, I'm sorry. I know, I know this is going to make me about as popular as a part of a space suit, but... That's all right. They still need to get through me before they even think about coming for you, so it's... <laughs> don't worry yeah, about it. But, you know... People that say you're not doing correct Taekwondo because you're not following what Choi says. Well, I'm sorry, but Choi was wrong. And his assessment of what techniques were actually full of Choi was wrong. He was a human being, for God's sake. He was he, he was fallible. You know, none of us are infallible. I'm not saying what, you know, I think what I'm saying is, is true. But then somebody could come along and correct me, and I'll hold my hands up and say, "Well, you, if you can demonstrate what I'm saying is rubbish, yeah. then show me, and I'll put my hands up because I, I'm not married to this idea of what I'm saying is true. Yeah. Because what I'm trying to do is find out what is true. You, you know, know. See, you do know because I know, and I'm, I'm eternally grateful that you follow the podcast. You, you don't. You're not just. Well, this is, I say, this is your second time on it. But you know that I put uh, a small clip of the podcast to advertise it before it goes out. Uh, yeah. That was it there, by the way. It was Stephen Gale, Six Degree World Champion, saying General Toy was wrong. Uh, and, and just... <laughs> Oh, I thought, I, thought I, I could see some people having an absolute aneurysm over that. You know? I'm not going to put anything before it. 
or anything nope. that we've just said after it. I'm just going to have you sitting there saying General Choi was wrong, and then the the if ever there was clickbait, that's it. Oh, that's what it is. Oh, I yep, and you you just see the the episode downloads going. Dug, 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 dug. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Right, okay. Let's let's move this on a wee bit. One of the things I'd actually written down. One of the things I'd actually written down here was how important are styles? Now, we've kind of covered that to a degree, and there's a bigger yeah. question coming after this, but how important are styles? I think styles are it's quite difficult in terms of style because styles are just variations on the theme. You know, much the same as a, a knife hand is a variant in one block, you know? Yep. So it's much more than it being about, it's what suits a person, you know? Now, I've, I've been GTF pretty much all my days. Um, I've never changed federation. I started off in Midwest, and Midwest joined the GTF. So yep. that, that was the kind of line that it took. Um, but Originally, we did a style much more akin to Cho's yep. icon. Very yep. linear, no sine wave, you know. And then it changed as we, we, we joined Grandmaster Park. But this, so I, I can't say I joined because of a style. Yeah. You know, I, I joined a club, I joined a, an instructor. I bought into what an instructor thought was right. Yeah. So realistically, I, I don't think styles in particular are of any importance other than continuing a legacy of the individual who created that style or created that concept, you know? So in, in terms of style, if it suits you I, I, and you feel comfortable within that style, then it's good for you. Yep. And it's... It's a good style then, you know. But even even within styles, if you look at, at various places, there's, there's differences within those styles. So what, what becomes a style? Is it a standardised format? Is it a set of rules? Is it a set of standards? Is it a certain set of criteria? What, what, what constitutes a style. It becomes very, very difficult when you go, yeah, you know, the further you break it down. But I, I like to think of a style as more of a legacy of an individual. So you have the ITF style, okay, or the Chang Hong style, which is choice legacy, which is huge. You know, yeah. you have um, uh, a Grandmaster Cho's style, where, where you have like to the TGB and GTI, uh, yep, AMR and all the within that kind of bracket. Yep. So that's kind of his legacy, you know? Um, and then you have uh, sort of Grandmaster Park's kind of style, but his his style really wasn't started by him. Mm -hmm. Do you know? It's just where he left kind of thing, yeah. you know? Um, <laughs> but there is a few things in there that would, would make it more his style, you know, and so that there's that element. Even what you, even what you say there now. This is where I find style to be, or or I think it's worthwhile having a discussion on style because. Show me somebody that's that's more, and I'm not. You know, I'm deliberately not going to use the word loyal here. Because that that opens up a, another whole can of worms within martial arts. But someone who personifies, and even that's a bit dodgy. I would happily use that for you, but I certainly wouldn't use it for me. But I think of Grandmaster Park, and I think of you, and I would associate. Let's use the word associate. Then I can't think of MD better or. MD who I associate more within the circle that I'm aware of. I don't associate MD else over you to Grandmaster Park. 
So I think someone, and I've, we've spoke about Grandmaster Park and we've spoke about Grandmaster Cho numerous times, and I know the respect you have for Grandmaster Park, you know the respect I've got for Grandmaster Cho, etc., etc. I find it so refreshing that you come out there and you just said, but looking at uh, Park Junte, Grandmaster Park's style, that, that was a, it, his style wasn't his, his own style, uh, not originally. Even just to say that is so refreshing. I mean, you, people that say, let's use general choice, or even just, let, let's cut away from Taekwondo for a second and say someone like uh, one of the Gracies for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or any of the karate styles or whatever it is, I find it so refreshing that you can even say that because there's so many people who won't hear a criticism at all about their heritage or their style to a degree that it becomes so restrictive. And if it's so restrictive to them, then in turn, it's so restrictive to their students. We, we've yeah. said, I, we've spoke about the Taekwondo patterns tonight and it's like, well, Again, you and I have spoken about this a million times. You post a video of me performing a Taekwondo pattern, talk to me through that lineage from Grandmaster Cho. So that's the way I go on the floor and I do that. And then you get comment after comment on social media. Why are you doing it that way? That's not the way General Choi done it. Why are you doing it that way? That's wrong. That's bad Taekwondo. That's this and that's that. Surely to God, that's restrictive. That's why yeah. style is, it's got a lot of negative connotations for me now. Yeah. Uh, but I'm looking at you, yeah. who's Grandmaster Park, all all the way, but you yeah. still have that maturity of thought that you can bring stuff in and push stuff out and reorganise it and do this and do that. Well, that's, I mean, at the end of the day, we all only do an interpretation of somebody else's interpretation of somebody else's interpretation so somebody else dead. You know, no, not one of us, and I include the grandmasters and the true greats of Taekwondo and martial arts in general, yeah. can say that any of us have had any kind of unique idea when it comes to martial arts. We haven't. All we've done is varied a theme. That's all anybody has done is they've taken a theme and they've done a variant. The, what annoys me about the people that say that's bad Taekwondo or that's not how General Choi did it or that's not how Grandmaster Park did it or that's not how um, Bokman Kim did it or Jun Ri or anybody like that. They say that's not how they did it. And I'm not them. I, I, I can't do what they did. You know, Grandma Sapar used to drop six inches of wooden break at his heart. I can't do that. Yeah. What I do is my interpretation of what Grandma Park did. His was an interpretation of before that and before that and before that and before that. So for me to get a full understanding of what I can do, I can't dismiss anything. You know, I dismiss nothing, but I accept nothing either. So if, if, if somebody shows me a technique um, in jiu-jitsu, for example, I'll be saying, right, show me that while I'm punching you in the face. Because, you know, the best quote ever was Mike Tyson. We all have a plan until we get punched in the face. Yeah. And it is absolutely true, you know? So you show me that while I'm sticking my heel through your face. How's that going to work? What if I'm doing this? What if I'm doing that, you know? And this is the point. If we stick rigidly to a style or a theory, yeah, because that's what styles are, are a theory of how it should be done. There's not concrete. There's nothing about it that you can say this is the only style in the world that will work. Come on, so like, like, how many people do? But you know they do. So yeah, I know they do. I've I've had so many. You know, this is what that was actually one of the reasons why I left Facebook, uh, and I left a lot of groups that were supposed to be for open-minded discussion. And as soon as you opened your mind, they shut theirs. You know, 
<laughs> yeah. And it was frightening to see. And it, what, you know, there was one in particular that really annoyed and really got my goal. And it was from a grandmaster. And they said, if you're not following this, you're not doing real title. And I, 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 I just looked at him and thought, you're the problem. You are the problem with martial arts. You are the arrogance that stops us from evolving. You know, that closed-minded idea that somehow that what they're doing was the only thing of any value or any validity. And it's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a really, it's a tragic situation. It's horrible, and, yeah. And that they, they would close it up so much that they think that all that there is before. And you know what the funniest bit of it was when he was doing the technique? And I think I pointed that out to you. His stance was wrong. The block was in the wrong place. <laughs> according to what I know. You yeah. know, according to what I do. So it's like, well, I could say all of that about what you're doing. Yeah. But I choose not to. I choose not to say that what you're doing is wrong. And there was a thing, there was a, 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 a great example is when karate can't do a taekwondo part. There was a great mm-hmm. example of what, I, I, can't, I can't remember her name, but it was Maggie. Right. And we nicknamed her Maggie Miz because she was just awesome. Okay. Was absolutely brilliant. Now the pattern looked nothing like, it was gay back, um, but the pattern looked nothing like gay I've seen this eye, yep. yeah. Yeah. But I absolutely loved it. And I, I, I tell you why I loved it is because she lived that part. Yeah. She didn't just do it. She didn't just perform it. She absolutely gave it a gusto. And it was great. You know, I would never win a Taekwondo competition, but then Taekwondo competition patterns are not patterns, are performances, you know. Um, so you can perform a pattern in a competition. Don't actually yeah. You know, good patterns don't win competitions. Pretty patterns do. You know, yeah. You, you look at a good pattern, you think, Oof, yeah, I wouldn't want to be hit by that. It doesn't look yeah. very nice, but you wouldn't want hit by it. I, I tell you, one of the, the prime examples I like is if you watch Master Hutton. Uh huh. Yes. And um, uh, Solska, Mister Solska, the you know the the guy yeah, that's I, like, yeah, you yeah, brilliant Solska, pattern. The, the Polish exponent. Yep. Yeah, I yep. get beautiful pants, don't get me wrong, technically superb. Master Hutton's aren't as technical as his, but I tell you what, I know who I would pick in a fight and it wouldn't be Master Hutton. Because if he hit you, you know you're you you're staying down. And yeah. and, and that's that's the thing when you, you look at it, but oh, I've lost the point of what I was saying there. Where was well, I, I, was, I, I, I in, in my school I call that ugly taekwondo. I've, and I've heard Master Hutton talk about this, and I think that's where you're going with that. Like, yeah, and yeah. as an ITF exponent, he's pretty critical of that. That listen, guys, it's, it looks pretty, but we're not making shapes, as he would say. We're, yes, yeah, we're delivering the technique. It's, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, and a lot of what he says, I really, really connect with. Yep, you know. So if I if I'm restricting myself to everything that Grandmaster Park says on only GTF Masters, I therefore can't listen to ITF Masters. Yeah, that, but that's absurd because I actually agree with one of the ITF Masters. Why why on earth would you want to restrict yourself from that kind of experience, that kind of knowledge, that kind of understanding, that kind of expertise yeah well, well, I don't understand why you would do it and I, this is where I get very upset with um, people when they say you're doing it wrong well who says who are you to judge how I do Taekwondo who am I to judge what you do yeah I can't I can't judge what you do I mean I don't know where you started from you know, who sets the standards? Who sets what is expected in Taekwondo? Who is has to be on it? It wasn't General Choi. 
if it was General Choi, then there would be no other Taekwondo's. Yep. We know that's not true. So it's people's opinions on what is effective. And that's where styles kind of originate from. Styles are no more than opinions. You know, the, 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 you know, Grandmaster Park had an opinion, but it wasn't his own opinion. His opinion was based on what other people had done. Yeah. And that's all we're doing. You know, so we are doing what other people have done. And if people want to say general choice the only the only way, well, I'll tell you what, take it back to when it started. Take it back to when General Choi called it Taekwondo. Show me what he was doing then. Because that's Choi's real Taekwondo. Yep. But he evolved. Yeah. I can't be evolved. Why do they have to stick themselves to 2002? We're almost 20 years away from that. Yep. You know, look how much Taekwondo evolved in that first 20 years. It was, you know, monumental. Yeah. You know, you think about all the introduction of the patterns, they all happened. You know, the, I think the first 24 happened in the first 20 years. So if, yep. if we'd, you know, we'd still be doing Gojiru patterns or Shotokan patterns. Yep, and it, this isn't just a Taekwondo thing. This is a every martial art thing. It's, do you know one of the uh, one of the one of the things one of the, the martial artists that I try and listen to a lot, uh, and some people will know who I'm talking about straight away, but I'll explain is a, a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor called John Danaher. John Danaher was uh, a student of Henzo Gracie's. But he went on to make what's called the Danaher Death Squad, which is guys like Gordon Ryan and was the, he was the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach of George St. Pierre, who you and I actually spoke about the last time you were on the podcast as well. So this guy is the the top of the food chain Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach. And his guys are very forward thinking where it comes to leg locks. Now in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu up until, call it 15 years ago, it was frowned upon, frowned upon for anybody to attack the legs. Again, because people forget that Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, if you trail the lineage back, did go to Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Judo and etc. etc. The point of this is that it wasn't until he had somebody come to his school and actually say to him, something dead simple, why would you possibly forget about 50% of the body? Why Why would you, if you're fighting somebody, you're in combat with somebody, why possibly, if you're a smart guy, forget about 50% of the body? And it was like a light bulb moment and he's like, why would I forget about 50% of the body? And now they're tearing ankles and knees off everybody. They're destroying people because yeah. things evolved. Yeah. Now, his instructor, Henzo Gracie's dad, was Helio Gracie, who is the man in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. But eventually it has to grow its sort of branches yeah. and branch out and, and, and change and hopefully improve. So restricted so, sometimes. It is, but you look at evolution, you look at the way evolution works, and you talk about speciation, and you talk about clades and all of this kind of thing when, it, you know, the, the genome splits and you get these variants. That's how it works. You know, that's how martial arts is supposed to be a synonym for life. Life evolves. Martial arts has to evolve yep. along with life. And those who don't evolve will eventually die out. You know, tradition only goes so far. You know, um, I, I would argue there's no such thing as tradition in martial arts. I, I, I would argue that point because none of us can say that we train traditionally. Yeah. Not, 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 none of us can say that. Um, I, you know, so 
That's my next question for it. Sorry, Mr. Gale. That's my next question. What is tradition? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid tradition doesn't exist. It's only a thing. Yeah. You, you don't, but none of us train traditional. None of us do. And, and it kind of confuses me a little bit because you see things like traditional karate or beach balls and um, traditional shotokan. Well, Shotokan isn't traditional. That was 1912. That's contemporary. You know, when you're in the sort of span of it, when you take it back thousands of years, you know, it's only been around for 109 years. Yeah. So it's not exactly traditional. And then you see in the next leaflet that they bring out, modern karate. Well, which are you? Are you traditional or are you modern? Are you contemporary or are you traditional? It's again, it's a way that they sell their art. You know, it's a it's a way of promoting whatever is the in thing at the time. Is it about being modern and contemporary, or is it about being traditional? And this is what we use the terminology quite freely. You know, traditional kung fu or traditional. Jiu-jitsu. Yeah. You know, I've even seen it say traditional Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which is quite bizarre. Aye. Yeah. You know, or, or the, I mean, there's another one that it's an MMA gym, but they have on it traditional martial arts as one of their classes. Well, what martial art are you training traditionally? Because yeah. I doubt very much that you will be because you're not killing each other. You know. And that's how you used to train in martial arts. When you sparred or you fought, the other person didn't survive. A friend of mine uh, said this to me once, and it just cut me off completely. And it, again, it, it it was one of those just wee things where you just have a wee spark, a wee light bulb moment, and you think there's nothing edu there's nothing more educational to a person than realizing that their 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 concept or something is full of crap when you realize that you're talking crap yourself then it's a brilliant moment if if you've got the proper attitude as i remember this person uh teaches and again the terms i'm going to use when i tell this very quick story are that they can all be taking me a pinch of salt, and you've just highlighted why, but they teach a more modern system, right, of Taekwondo. And I remember sitting, talking to them, and uh, me kind of being a wee bit disrespectful towards it. But to a degree, I'm talking about a friend here, uh, but just say, no, nah, no, nah, I, I, I prefer teaching traditional Taekwondo. This was years ago. This is when I wasn't just as daft. Uh, I was a wee bit more daft than what I am now. Uh, and I remember him turning around and saying, so do you walk about and hit the students with a stick? And uh, I was like, no. Nah. And he was like, well, what are you talking about? Like, what tradition? How far are you going back with this tradition? Because it used to be that you would have had... I mean, I can imagine... And you hear about... Grandmaster Park will have the same stories as Grandmaster Cho. Like... If we taught traditional Taekwondo, hitting people with sticks and putting them in a sitting stance for four hours and doing down block, we wouldn't have any students. I don't know anybody who teaches traditional, whatever that's meant to mean, Taekwondo. We'd be in jail. No, I, I know. Well, I, yeah, no, we absolutely would be. Yeah. And when he did that to me, I thought to myself, do you know what? Kareem, get off your high horse here, like... And again, it's just a wee moment of sort of self-realisation. That... And that, that's what it's about. I mean, Durant said that um, education is the discovery of our own ignorance. And I think that sums it up beautifully, is that we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. So, you know, so we don't know it. You know, we, don't, we can't be aware of what we don't know until we realise the fact. We don't know it, you know. Yeah. I, I, I think a lot of times that I don't know if you've ever heard of the Dunning Kruger effect. 
go ahead, please. It's the way the less a person understands the subject, the more arrogant they are about it. Okay. So what was the name of that again? Sorry, just repeat that for me, please. The Dunning Kruger effect. The Dunning Kruger effect. Yeah. Okay. If, yep. you, if you look it up, it's basically, in summary, it's the, the, the less a person understands the subject, the higher up they are in their arrogance. They think they know everything. And then when they start to realise, oh my God, I don't know anything, their arrogance starts to come down. But then they start understanding and they, they turn into the confidence zone. Yeah, okay. And that's the difference, but you never get up to where you were before. Yeah. You know, because you're always on that slightly upward journey of, yeah. of understanding. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good one to, to look up. It's a psychological uh, term. Dunning Kruger effect, but yeah, it's, so when, when we're talking about things like that, we, we realize that we don't know something, yeah. you know, and you think, Why don't I know that? You know, this is fantastic, and that's what I mean about being more excited about Taekwondo than I ever have been. Is that because it's like, I've been doing it 34 years, why don't I know that? Yeah, bit of it, why don't I know? You know the the angles of this technique, or you know. Okay, uh, as I said, I, I I want to just sort of recap what I was thinking as we headed into this this episode. I think we 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 laid a lot of groundwork back in what did I say episode nine? Yeah. But it was big subjects, and again, the podcast was very young at that stage, and. Uh, I've obviously grown in a bit of confidence as well as to what I want to do with it. And there was huge, big subjects that I wanted to discuss with you again. So just to repeat that again one more time, people can go back to episode nine. Uh, if you're sitting there wondering, who's this really interesting guy that's talking to Kareem tonight? Go back to episode nine and you'll find out who this really interesting and very knowledgeable guy is. But there's these huge big subjects that I want to just throw at you tonight and let's see where the conversation goes. The next one is maybe the biggest one that I want to cover with you. Uh, and here's the question. What is a martial artist? So I know that that's just a, here, deal with that question and it could, this could fill another hour or it could be two minutes. I don't know, but what is a martial artist? In very short, it's somebody that does martial arts. <laughs> okay. That's it. You know, is it, that, that, it is, yeah, um, because martial arts does not create a person. It merely reveals their character. You know, I know some people that have been martial arts for a long time who are absolute, I wouldn't spend five minutes in the same room as them, you know? There's other people who use martial art for their own gain, whatever that gain might be. There are other people who want to put everything back into martial arts, and that's fine as well. So, you know, a martial artist is, I think Grandmaster Park, uh, what I liked about him was he had a very, very simplistic view about things. Uh, and it's very easy to follow, like right, the do, you know, Taekwondo. People attribute all this kind of Bushido warrior code stuff into it and all this nonsense. They say, no, it's just the way you do stuff. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's what yeah. the do is. It's how you actually do it, you know? If, if the do was all this spiritual stuff, you wouldn't have so many bad guys in martial arts, you wouldn't have so many bad guys doing that thing. And that was his kind of thought process. So, yeah, a martial artist, now, a good martial artist, that's a different concept. You right. Know, what makes a good martial artist, again, it's very, very subjective. There's not any real objectivity to that subject. Uh, a, a good martial artist is somebody that has trained in the art, they're diligent, they work hard, they try and follow a moral code, you know, they look after themselves, they look after the people around them. That would be a good martial artist. Other people might say, well, a good martial artist is somebody that can kick a hundred people. 
needs. That's a very, certainly a very flexible martial artist. I don't know, if, me personally, I wouldn't say that makes him a good martial artist. Yeah. So, so it's very, very subjective, you know, but I, I would say, you know, a martial artist is just somebody that practices martial arts. It is not, there is no, there is no sort of spirituality that comes with martial arts. There is no good person that evolves out of it. You have to have that seed for it to grow. You know, you, you have to already be that person for it to grow. You know, it could be hidden with a whole lot of whole load of neuroses. Yep, yep. But at the end of the day, that seed still has to be there for it to grow. And martial arts just allows that to grow. Okay. Um, so know. I think the thing the way I put that across, I think the way I think about that is you have people who do martial arts, and then you've got martial artists. And the way you have framed that is you have martial artists and you have, there's the dog, <laughs> yeah. you have martial artists and you have good martial artists. Yes. Right, so, uh, okay, so let me put a twist on the question then. And you covered it there, but let's see if we can unpack it a wee bit more. What's a good martial artist? And I know you have just listed things there, but like yeah. another wee bit of that that I think we should investigate is uh, is the part about. In fact, let me get that right in my head first. So let's go over quickly. What's a good martial artist? Well, again, like I said, a good a good martial artist is a subjective point of view. It's an opinion, isn't it? Uh, yeah. It's something that one person says about another. Um, so, in a lot of ways, it's a it's a rather restrictive, unhelpful um, label that you're giving somebody. You you're a good martial artist. Well, no, I'm I'm a developing martial artist. I'm not the finished product. I never will be the finished product. Yeah. Does that make me a good martial artist, or does it make me a developing one? Do I want to develop or do I want to get to the point where I think, yes, I'm there? If I'm a good martial artist, then I've achieved what I'm trying to achieve. Therefore, I've nothing left to do. Uh, so, I, I, you know, I, I try not to label in, in that respect because I, I think it's a hindrance to okay. you actually developing as a martial artist and developing as a person. But if I want to develop as a person, I want to develop as a martial artist, I can't contain that within a label or a badge, you know, so I can't contain it within GTF Taekwondo, I can't contain it within Taekwondo, and I can't contain it within the idea that I'm already a good martial artist. So from a personal perspective, I would rather, I mean, I think that the, the most flattering thing somebody can say is that he's trying to Okay, yeah. For me, if, if somebody said he's trying to understand martial arts, he's trying to be a good martial artist, that's probably the, the the biggest compliment that I would be able to get in terms of that. Identifying a bad martial artist, however, yep. is a little easier, you know, yep. and it's the people that use their grade as some kind of rod to beat you with, or mm -hmm. they, they'll use and abuse the power that they have. Yeah. You know? And, it, you know, we, 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 we put it to religion before, you know, what makes a good or a bad um, exponent of that religion. Yeah. And it's exactly the same concept. You know, you would never say that you are a, a good Christian or a good Muslim. You, you're, you're trying to be good. You haven't achieved it yet because you yep. don't achieve it. For most religions, you don't achieve that until you actually die and transcend to heaven. Indeed. You know, yep. so you, in that respect, you're trying to be good, you're trying to be devout, you're trying to follow the code of that religion. So, in, in a similar vein, you know, you can identify within religions bad people. Yeah. You know, there's bad people in all religions. You look at some of the atrocities that have been carried out over the years in the name of 
various religions. You know, you pick one and you can pick and well, all of them, people. unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But that, that again, that doesn't account for the majority of religious people. And yeah. It's the same with martial arts. You know, you can pick out the bad ones. You know, you can pick them out and say, oh my God. And one of my favorites, um, and I do love this guy, it's wonderful. It's a guy called Ashida Kim. Okay. Have you ever looked him up on YouTube? Do you know, I haven't. And the last time we spoke in the phone, about three weeks right. ago or four weeks ago, he actually told me to. He's on my notes for that conversation on my phone. He's wonderful. I don't know if it's a parody or if he actually is trying to sell himself in this way. Yeah. But it's the most hilarious thing you'll ever watch, especially the Forbidden Fist. Yeah. The Forbidden Fist of the Ninja is just, Wonderful. It is so funny. And he actually looks like my dad trying to impersonate what I do. Okay. You know, it's just it's so funny. Um, he's a bad martial artist. Okay. You, know, that, right, uh, you just watch and you think, yeah, that's a bad martial artist. He's, he's perpetuating uh, a ridiculous lie in order to make money. And that's, and I've got no qualms about people making money in martial arts because, you know, what people earn is their own business. Yeah. But do it properly. Yeah. You know, don't sell people things that are untrue just to feed your bank balance because that makes you a thief. You know, and, and that's not fair. You know, it's not fair on people. Um, <laughs> By, by all means, make money out of it. You know, yep. sell books, sell magazines, sell your class, have a huge class, have thousands of students, you know. You know, you de people deserve to make a living out of something that they obviously love and enjoy yep. and are good at. Yeah. Don't, don't sacrifice. Yep. You actually things. don't need to. You actually don't need to. No, you don't. See, one of the things that... Uh, one of the things that I don't know, I don't know, we, have, we haven't investigated this enough. It's one of those ones that I've heard you say this and you just said it again. And I, I, I want to talk to you about this because I haven't investigated it in my own head. And this is about Taekwondo or martial arts uh, showing someone's character rather than changing it. And that's going to be really disappointing for some people listening to this at this stage of the conversation. Maybe that will change when you explain it a wee bit more, but are we saying it is basic that if you're a good guy, martial arts will make you a better guy, and if you're a horrible guy, you'll be a horrible guy with a black belt? <laughs> is that what we're saying? Yeah. Pretty okay. much. Pretty, nice. pretty, pretty much. It is... It is. You know, the martial arts cannot change a person. A person can change themselves. Okay, that's different, right? Yep. You know, a, a person can change, but that has to come from their core beliefs. Now, the, the, way, the way it works is that everything that we do, everything that we are, comes from a set of core beliefs about ourselves and about other things, okay? Yeah. So... And if we, if things interact with those core beliefs, we will react in a certain way, okay? So it's the ABC model, okay? So you have the actuating event, you have the core belief, and then you have the emotional consequence, okay? So it's actuating event, belief, consequence, okay? And that's how it works. Now, yeah. life is 10% what happens to us and 90% how we react to it. So with that in mind, if, if somebody has a core belief of being a certain way, then that is how they're going to react. So until they change that core belief, they are never going to change how they react. And they're always going to be that person. It's not yeah. until they actually fundamentally change themselves. The martial arts can't do that. It can give the person the tools in order to do that. But it's the same way that you give a tractor to a farmer you know if the, if the farmer doesn't use it it's just a tractor it's never going to plow his field 
And it's yeah. exactly the same thing with martial arts. Unless they actually fundamentally allow it to change them, then they will never, ever change them. It's always good to see. And that goes for all facets of life. You know, um, you get a lot of people who wear these labels or wear anxiety, depression, and all these things as a comfort blanket. That is who they are, when actually, no, it's not who they are. What they have to do is change this core belief, this this fundamental premise that they hold in their unconscious mind. Yeah. Change that, and then they change their reaction, which changes how other people perceive them. And it's that perception that denotes whether somebody's good or bad. You know, good, good, good or bad does not exist outside of our perception. So only our perception is good or bad. I'm glad I asked that question because that's that changes it quite quite dramatically. Actually, it's and you know you you're not the only person by far of the people who I respect. Who, who draw the conversation back to uh, a wee bit of sort of self-responsibility, a wee bit of yeah. uh, you you making the decision because, it, again, martial arts is this thing that we're, we've spent an hour and however long it is talking about, but it's like everything else. It can be used as a, as a crutch for people, can't it? It can be used for... It's it's the martial arts fault for this, or it's my religion's fault for this, or it's whoever's fault. Uh, and yeah, it wasn't until you just said that 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 just became a wee bit clearer for me there. Yeah, and it is that sense of responsibility. You know, uh, I feel like that because they made me. No, you feel like that because you feel like that. Nobody else owns your feelings. You know, I, I have no responsibility over your feelings. You're responsible for how you feel. However, I can only be responsible for how I act. Now, if I act in a way that is upsetting somebody, then I have to look at myself and go, right, what am I doing to upset that individual? Do I need to change? Or is it their responsibility to change how they react and how they feel? We, you know, we can't be responsible for other people. We can, we can't. We can only be responsible for ourselves. And we can only do um, what we, you know, how we react to things. And that's why I say it's ninety percent how we react. You know, um, ten percent how you know what, of what actually happens. Yep. I, uh, I've gotten into the habit of of asking these concluding questions for guests. I'm not going to do that with you, actually, uh, very specifically, because this has been chapter two of this discussion. And I say I always ask for a, a nice wee sort of send off for guests who I, I, I may not have an intention or I, I don't see me bringing back onto the show. But as I say, I think this is only chapter two for you, Mr. Gale. I think there might even be a chapter three and maybe a chapter four, and just every sort of six, nine, every year, uh, months, we can just kind of fall back into it. So, uh, I, so I think what's left is just to say thank you. I, I, I love every time we talk, but I'm so glad that we made the decision to record one of them again. Uh, no, thanks for having us. It's been, uh, I've really, really enjoyed it. Um... Uh, I, as I say, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that there with this uh, hope that we can carry on for another discussion and maybe even an hour, two or three after this. Definitely, anything you want, is, uh, just, just give us a shout and I'll, I'll be happy to. Um, we always enjoy it. Brilliant. Right, guys, uh, we will leave it there. Mr. Stephen Gale, thank you so much, sir. Uh, and I'll catch up with you soon. No problem. Thank okay, you today. cheers. Thank Take you care. Yourself. Take care. Cheers. God bless you. Bye.